welcome back one and all to another episode of For the Love of Furniture, where together we take a look at all of the furniture on permanent display at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. My name is Tony Allgaier, and I am your resident designer and lover of furniture. As you may recall on our previous episodes, we discovered pieces that were created based off of trends first made popular by Great Britain, including this Victorian sofa and Chippendale slant front desk. These furniture pieces were reinterpreted from their stylistic origins from Britain for the American market. Compared to our previous episodes, the piece we will rediscover today has quite a unique history, primarily because this 19th century piece stems from a small valley known as Soap Hollow, which is near Somerset County, Pennsylvania. That's right, we are going to delve deep into the history and sought after popularity of this statuesque Soap Hollow seven drawer chest. Ooh. At first sight, you marvel at the deep red color and distinct stenciling and detailed decorations with prominent markings on both the left and the right side panels. The label on display says that the craftsperson who created this chest was Jeremiah Stahl in 1867. So where exactly is So Paulo? Who was Jeremiah Stahl? And why is this piece of such significance that it is now on display at the museum? What is the history behind this 154-year-old piece? And what inspired these 19th century craftspeople in rural Pennsylvania to create such aesthetically pleasing pieces that are still sought after by collectors today? Let's first travel back to the early 1800s to a small valley at the foothills of Chestnut Ridge of the Allegheny Mountains. This area is no more than three miles long and two miles wide. Named after the German designation, and correct me if my German pronunciation is completely wrong, Schmiersef Self Dirsch, or Schmierself, meaning soft soap hollow after the once prevailing cottage soap making industry by the women who resided here in the early 19th century. Soap Hollow was first settled by the Amish in the mid 1700s. Then, by the later half of the century, Mennonites of both German and Swiss ancestry began to settle there as well. The Amish and Mennonites, known as the Pennsylvania Dutch, were farmers who lived off the land using tools they created or had passed down from generation to generation. Their concept of education and any questions of day-to-day -day life is based off of their interpretation of the Bible. A hard work and simplistic lifestyle govern their work, their clothes, even down to how their clothes are worn. They believe that anything that isn't plain is English and to them must be rejected. They lived a cloistered lifestyle and stayed true to their beliefs and not exposing themselves to what they referred to as non-believers. Their rigid rules and discipline was all focused around the community instead of focusing on oneself. Everyone had their role to play. The role of men and boys was to tend to the land and provide for the family. The role of women and girls was to tend to the home, cooking, and creating the family's clothing. Children did go to school and were taught the language known as Pennsylvania Dutch. This is a dialect which is not quite German and has its roots based in Pennsylvania. Among all of the townspeople, there was one man who stood out among the rest. His name was John Sala, wearing many hats, including farmer, an undertaker, and even an up-and-coming furniture maker. Believed to have been with his parents among one of the earliest settlers of this area. 
His successful furniture career spanned three decades, making handmade cradles, cupboards, two drawer work tables, miniature chests of drawers, blanket chests, and large chests of drawers. Unfortunately, there is little documentation of the people during this time, other than a few census records, tax papers, and estate papers. If there is one thing that the Pennsylvania Dutch have taught me, it's how to keep a good diary. Dearest diary, today I learned that I've been neglecting you for too long. So how are you? I can't wait to hear from you. Love always, Tony. Although the 1876 Beers Atlas shows a carpenter shop in Sao Paulo, there is no indication of who owned it or whether it was used by one or more of the cabinetry makers of the time. It is believed that the furniture was produced only during the slower winter months when the men were not busy with farming. Public records support this idea since John Sala was listed sometimes as a carpenter and other times of the year as a farmer. John Sala was not the only maker of this distinctive Sao Paulo furniture. However, he was the change agent who synthesized and established the visual vocabulary of form and decoration that we recognize as Sao Paulo furniture. We know little about Sala's life before 1840, but we do know that John Sala was born and raised in Somerset County. He married Magdalena Miller, and they had 13 children, including eight sons. He is listed in the official records as both a carpenter and a farmer. His obituary states that he was an undertaker by trade and made 329 coffins for those who died in his neighborhood. Now, I know what you're thinking, because I was thinking the same exact thing. This is a bit of a morbid thought, but when put into context in the mid-1800s, rural Pennsylvania, and a small town atmosphere, everyone really does have to play their role in the development of the community. And since John Sala already knew how to create furniture, he could easily make a box that someone could lie in. Mm. Creepy, but it's true. And he did it really well. Sala trained many other carpenters of the time in the same Sao Paulo furniture style that became so popular in this area, including two out of his eight sons. By 1840, John Sella had become a cultural leader by virtue of his furniture production and his undertaking business. His furniture was, and still is, highly respected within the local Mennonite community, a fact reinforced by the persistence of the forms and decorations long after his death, and the preservation of the furniture over time. Sala defined the concept of good fit for domestic furnishings. His relatively expensive and symbolic furniture was a daily reminder for those owners of their cultural identity and social status. And again, not just a furniture maker, but also an undertaker, Sala truly did preside over the Mennonite community in his small town of Sao Paulo, literally from cradle to grave. The four primary rites of passage for rural life included birth, adolescence, marriage, and death. Through his furniture creations, John Sala was implicated in all of these stages of life in his community. Eight cabinet makers are associated with the Sao Paulo School of Cottage Craftsmen. All produce furniture with similar designs, construction, and decoration. The majority was paint decorated and incorporated cut paper stencil decoration. Dark red or maroon with black moldings and feet were popular color combinations. Some later pieces were green decorated and had floral decals as embellishments. The stencil decoration was often done in gilt or included floral and geometric design work. 
Many soap hollow chests possess the initials of the individual it was made for on the front left and the date to the right. The primary soap hollow furniture form was the chest and chest of drawers. Although other furniture pieces were created as well, including sewing boxes, cradles, rope beds, Dutch cupboards, hanging cupboards, and even a tall case clock are known to exist. This unique body of work that is so polo expresses a material culture rooted in both Germanic and neoclassical traditions. While the Pennsylvania Germans in the eastern part of the state decorated their furniture with freehand ornamentations until the second half of the 19th century, those in Somerset County utilized stencils from the beginning of the construction. The stencil is an age-old tool, and stenciling, the art of applying design to the surface through superimposed openings, is an ancient craft. The stenciled initials and dates on the furniture represent the persons for whom the pieces were made and the dates of manufacturing, in keeping with the Mennonite tradition of dowries. It says here that the bride's dowry of linen, silver, and other household items was often kept in a dowry chest that was either made newly for her or inherited from her mother or grandmother. Men's dowries consisted of clothing such as linen shirts, tools, and sometimes even farm animals. Wardrobes, chairs, clocks, and other pieces of furniture, too, were even given as dowry. Fascinating. Perhaps the most distinguishing hallmark of Sao Paulo furniture is the way in which pieces were signed. The makers prominently stenciled their names or initials preceded by the words manufactured by or letters MF. Rather than follow the traditional practices of signing the furniture in less conspicuous places, such as the bottom of plank chairs or the back of chests, the soap hollow makers boldly placed their marks on the front and sides of larger pieces. Though not all makers signed their names, nor are all of the pieces actually signed. Jeremiah Stahl was the identified maker to stray from the typical soap hollow signature. Both decorative art students and experts have characterized the earliest pieces as country Sheridan. But Jeremiah Stahl, by adding a slight swell at the top of the chest, offered a transition to the popular empire style. Between 1845 and 1874, keyhole shields on the furniture were inlaid. The earliest knobs that used to be made by sandwich type glass began to be replaced by porcelain pools around 1860. Within 10 years, porcelain pools completely replaced glass knobs. Fellow craftsmen eventually copied Stahl's styling for furniture produced. The Sao Paulo craftsmen used whatever wood was available to them. This include cherry, walnut, maple, hickory, chestnut, poplar, and even pine. They dovetailed and mortise joints to secure them with wooden pins. Wooden wedges were sometimes inserted to secure tightness in construction. Square-headed nails secured drawer bottoms and guides, as well as scroll splashbacks, but wooden screws were also used. Jeremiah Stahl occasionally fashioned raised panels, while the Sala brothers chose reeded end panels for more major pieces. Chests of drawers always featured a scrolled backsplash, while all cupboards were fitted with quarter-turned pilasters. Blanket chests usually bowed above the front skirt and rested on bracket-type feet. 
primarily a traditional buttermilk red paint and sometimes a deeper maroon with a medium brown or black grain was used. The traditions of the soap hollow furniture craftsmen truly remained even after John Sala passed away. Today, Sala's spirit and that of his sons and other apprentices lives on through the things that they created. Their choices and skills are quite evident, but the furniture is more expressive of culture than any craftsman's individual tastes. So Palo Furniture is first and foremost unmistakably Pennsylvania German in form, construction, and decoration. This furniture style is the product of international neoclassicism, an aesthetic movement which swept through continental Europe and the British Isles in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. From the settlement of Schmier Seif Dersch through today, 90% of the population is Mennonite, while fourth generation descendants speak a Pennsylvania German or Pennsylvania Dutch dialect. In fact, many school children had to be taught to speak English, and the Stahl Mennonite Church, the only church in Sao Paulo, regularly conducted services in German until 1939. Today, about 85% of the residents speak a dialect they call Pennsylvania Dutch. Most of the history of Sopalo's unique furniture and its makers has been lost during the last century, but the known 175 identified pieces attest not only to the 19th century handicraft, but the rich legacy of these craftspeople. It is rare that early settlers of Southern Pennsylvania desired pieces crafted and decorated in their own traditions, particularly because inexpensive mass-produced furniture could be purchased easily in Pittsburgh and nearby communities. But thankfully for us, it is in good fortune that avid collectors and institutions are continuing their quest for these unusual pieces. Now let's take an in-depth look detailing the Soap Hollow 7-Drawer Chest made by Jeremiah Stahl on display at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. Although the chest is unsigned, this important example of Soap Hollow furniture is firmly attributed to Jeremiah Stahl. This attribution is primarily due to certain stylistic elements including the borders around the initials and date, the bright Chinese red, and the stenciled drawer pool surrounds. This chest has been recognized as an icon of Sopalo furniture by the latest book on this Western Pennsylvania cabinet making school by Charles Mueller, which illustrates it on its cover. The museum's chest, which was made in 1867, has porcelain drawer pools, but earlier knobs would have been made from sandwich glass. Additional brown Rockingham knobs still exist for this piece in the museum's archive. Its decoration is both painted and stenciled, as was typical on pieces made by members of the community. This chest incorporates stenciled birds, a floral design around the pools, and quote mark-like strokes around the initials of the person the piece was made for. Many of these motifs, like birds and flowers, are found in various configurations on other domestic crafts made by the Pennsylvania Dutch communities. This piece has decorative elements common amongst all Sopalo furniture, such as a waved patterned backsplash and even a shaped skirt at the bottom. It is also painted in an intense Chinese red, a color favored by Sopalo workers in different strengths. Jeremiah Stahl was known for using very bright concentrations of this Chinese red as seen on this piece. 
This piece has clearly been put to good use over its lifetime. You can see on the top face that someone used to store newspapers here since the ink has been transferred to it. Recess panels on both sides are painted black. If you tried to open the set of smaller three drawers at the top, you would notice that they are all locked. The way to open these drawers is to actually open the first larger drawer and press up on the angled wood blocker. This simple design is very effective and so clever. When you open the drawers, you can truly see the cherry and tulip poplar wood in greater detail, void of painted decoration. You also get more of a sense for the wedge drawer dovetails. A simple extension of the drawer base creates a bumper for each of the drawers, protecting the back panel and helping the piece last for generations and generations. In 1880, Jeremiah Stahl left his house and adjacent cabinetry shop and moved near Michigan. Absence of records and furniture indicate that he probably did not make furniture after leaving the state. His stands, cradles, chests of drawers, and blanket chests are easily recognized by their bright colors and their extensive stenciling. His last known piece was dated in 1874. Some may interpret these heavily sought after pieces as the work of folk artists whom we instinctively admire for their creativity and craftsmanship. All furniture is created with a functional purpose in mind, and there is no exception with this piece. I was taken to the museum's vault to see an additional Sopalo piece created by two makers of the same time period, Peter Thomas and Christian Blow, in 1859. In true Sopalo tradition, this piece is quite similar in detailing to the one by Jeremiah Stahl. The deep red colors, beautifully placed stenciling, and locking top drawers also exist. It still even has its original sandwich glass drawer pools. It is very impressive that a distinct decorative tradition can emerge in the mid-19th century in a relatively remote community. So Palo Furniture is not the spontaneous creation of just one person, but instead the product of the interaction of that person with the woodworking and religious traditions within which he was trained. The furniture and its ornamentation are therefore expressions of community as articulated by the maker and those who are trained by him. Well, that is all from this episode of For the Love of Furniture. Stay tuned for our next episode to discover more about the furniture on display at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. Until then, stay happy, stay healthy, and stay curious. <laughs>